Welcome to part two of our interview with Dr. Heather Lynn about demonic artifacts. The mummy's curse is is actually, um, I think, something legitimate in a way, and it depends on how you look at it. Um, so, for instance, you know, most people are aware of the idea that if you find a mummy, you know, in Egypt, do not touch it or, or, you know, all the movies have been, you know, portraying that idea that if you do something that it's going to come back and, and, uh, you're going to suffer as a result or, you know, basically suffer from a curse. Well, this is, uh, something that people had talked about for a long time. It wasn't until I think National Geographic did some work on it. A lot of people started working to look at, is there any truth with this? And, you know, they found that, what could be at the heart of why there are a number of people who get ill or even die after after excavating, uh, you know, Egyptian tombs, mm-hmm. um, it, it actually could be because of the different uh, molds, bacteria, things that are on the walls that are, you know, breathed in when the when the tomb is open sure and so that it can cause like blood you know all, all sorts of problems and you know, respiratory di- issues and those sorts of things they've also found that um, the embalming fluids that are used in some of the mummies um, are very toxic and if they have been sitting for you know thousands of years untouched and then finally exposed that way uh, we actually don't even know what's in some of these we don't know the chemical makeup mm-hmm. of all of them and so there's no telling and there's even been some tombs that have been intentionally poisoned so that it's you know made to protect looters who you know looters have been looting since the beginning sure and so you know some of the the ideas that are portrayed in maybe like the indiana jones movies or or something like that where there'd be traps set for the looters and that's a very real thing and so some of the traps uh that had been later were chemical and so people didn't really realize that and uh you know, it got so bad that the Central Connecticut State University in New Britain um, edited a uh, book called Dangerous Places, Health, Safety, and Archaeology that discussed the idea of how dangerous it is to breathe in the mold, spores, or, you know, anything else and chemical-wise that are either lying dormant in the earth or just part of the embalming process. And so you'll find that, yeah, there is such a thing as a pharaoh's curse. It's not necessarily magical. But it is, it is real. And it's interesting when you put it in that context. But then there's the question of, well, what's happened to, you know, some of the people that died who weren't in direct contact, but sure. they were in direct contact to those who did excavate. And those are those are still mysteries. It turns out all the mummies are wrapped in asbestos. That's uh, that's right. about it. Yeah. <laughs> but no, it, yeah. it, it, it's interesting because there, there, there's many things that, that can be looked into scientifically, like the spores and, and everything that would be in these things. And, and it, it, it kind of not to, debunks in a way, but more, more so finds an explanation for, um, you know, why why some of these things happen that otherwise may be looked at as mysterious or supernatural happenings. But it sounds like there's a lot of things, too, where it, you you can kind of just walk right up to the line of it's almost paranormal. We can't really prove it's it's not, but we can't really prove it is. But there's so many weird coincidences that yes. are out there that just can't quite be connected one way or another. I want to go ahead. Yeah, oh, I was going to, and it's really interesting because even those things that are really just seemingly unprovable, uh, there are people out there who are trying to still prove it from sure. the perspective of it, you know, being demons. So, and I, I discussed too in the book the uh, the idea of scientific demonology, where there are actual scientists in Morocco who've been studying the science, potential science behind spirit possession Mm -hmm. for decades. They have a a sort of germ theory of demonology that they they believe that there's a molecular explanation for demons. And so they, they, you know, think that jinn are are very real and they don't deny that at all in any way. They just at that point, try to say, well, then how can we fit the science around this? As opposed to debunking, sure. they say, well, let's see if we can have spirituality and science work. And so they've debel- developed this really interesting, you know, way of looking at it that takes into account, um, 
you know, all sorts of things that they could measure on a scientific basis. So much so, well, they, they believe that there are physical laws to these demons and the, that they have these life cycles and they can multiply rapidly after entering the bloodstream. And they've even devised a mathematic formula that can calculate and sort of um, predict the movement and behavior of these supposed jinn. And they really have it down to a science and they believe that, you know, there's a particular molecular composition to evil spirits that makes them um, react poorly to light, which would then explain why demons most most often appear at night or in the dark. And so they take all these ideas and they're sort of, you know, finding the science to to match that. And, um, you know, so it's interesting to, to question then should science dictate our beliefs or should our beliefs dictate our science is sort of a chicken or the egg thing. And so it's, um, you know, kind of an interesting way of looking at it. It is. I, I would love to hear more about the haunted bunk bed. And, and the reason I bring that up on, on our other podcast, Real Ghost Stories Online, we get stories in from individuals all over the world. Uh, I've been doing it now for about five years. Literally tens of thousands of stories have been shared from callers to letters. Um, and to the point where we, you know, there's certain themes that tend to come up naturally over and over. One of those objects that tends to come up on a semi-regular basis out of nowhere is haunted bunk beds. So much, really? to the, so much <laughs> to the point where it became a running joke on the show where every time we say bunk bed, we're going to ring a bell and we have this <laughs> bunk bed bell. And literally, I've, I've now I, I've printed up more than a thousand of these bells with our logo on. And then we give them to our, our premium members who support our program and they can ring along at home. It, 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 it's it's funny. I know. <laughs> it's uh, awesome. And and it's it's one of those things where I the first story I ever heard of a haunted bunk ballot bed was on Unsolved Mysteries in the 80s in Horicon, Wisconsin. Uh, I love that show. Yes. And, and that was <laughs> the first, you know, because I grew up near that area. And I thought, oh, great, a ghost story that's like 20 miles away. And <laughs> And it was of the haunted bunk bed. I don't know if you remember that epi- that uh, that episode or not, but it it was. I thought, oh, and I remembered this my entire life. And then I started doing a ghost show, and I, I referenced it several times. And and then we started getting stories. And, and I've gotten, I, I swear to God, hundreds of bunk bed stories of bunk beds that are haunted. Uh, the most compelling or or interesting piece of evidence, because I've been trying to over the years somewhat tie this these bunk bed stories together. Why are bunk beds? connected with, with, with the paranormal <laughs> Why, yeah. of, of all objects you know that that'd be the last thing i'd really pick um you know we're not getting stories of haunted um futons it's bunk beds <laughs> and 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 we did have one story um of of they 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 took the bunk bed apart this was someone who had all these stories of their childhood and strange things happening when they got the bunk bed uh, as an adult they they've Realize their parents still had the bunk bed in the attic. They went and looked at it. And underneath it on the boards uh, from the factory, there was was essentially markings on it, uh, pentagrams, things of that nature that would be related to satanic rituals and such. Now, I don't think mom and dad were having Satan parties uh, when the kids were sleeping, but this probably came from the factory that way or somebody had marked it that way. So the only thing I've been able to kind of conclude or, or, or maybe just be more curious about is <laughs> it sounds as bizarre as it is, you know, was there a bunk bed factory at some point in the seventies or eighties that had something going on in it with these beds? And there's been a large amount that have been distributed throughout the country or the world. Um, and then it, somehow produced this strange result of all these paranormal happenings. Um, that's that's as far as I've gotten. I've tried to narrow down well, what type of bed was it? You know, what, what was the model type uh, that I'd be looking for here to determine what exactly are we dealing with? But I, it, it's been hard because most of these are stories from 20, 30 years ago, and they don't remember, you know, bottles of a bunk bed. Um, Mm -hmm. But I'd love to hear your story that that you've investigated this in the book about the haunted bunk bed. Well, the bunk bed story that I, that I found that was weird. And I had no idea if before writing this, I had no idea how prevalent haunted home furnishings were. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that things like chairs and these items could, could have any element of a supernatural, 
you know, uh, phenomenon attached to them. So when I saw a possessed bunk bed, I thought, wait, that's awfully modern. That's something that, well, maybe bunk beds aren't the idea of bunk beds. And, you know, just, it was really weird. And so I, I saw that in the eighties. So yeah, definitely around the same time mm -hmm. that maybe this was all happening. Uh, you know, there was a woman who bought a set of used bunk beds from a thrift shop, you know, and her children, uh, you know, they were young and so they weren't old enough to, to have it yet, but because they didn't need them right away, her husband stored them in the cellar. And after a few years, the kids were old enough to, you know, get the bunk beds. And so she moved them in and, you know, out of the cellar and moved, moved them to the kids' room. And um, not long after that, then the, the kids started becoming really ill. And of course, you wouldn't think it's the bunk bed necessarily. And, you know, so the kids are ill and then weird things started happening in the house. Things like that you'd see on the movie Poltergeist. So furnishings would move around on their own. A chair would go across the, you know, slide across the room or mm -hmm. pictures would come off the wall and the radio would just randomly turn on and off. And the kids started having nightmares. Mm -hmm. Then they'd wake up in the night and scream and, and claim they saw a witch. So the parents asked a priest to come bless the beds, you know, which was, I guess, the, and <laughs> I don't know how long, you know, it, it took them to do that. But I mean, after seeing those things in your house, maybe... You know, that would make anybody go right to a priest, I suppose. Sure. So, as I, you know, but but basically uh, the 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 kid's father was a little spectacle or I'm, I'm sorry, skeptical. I'm very <laughs> it's warm in here. I needed <laughs> a, a, another drink of water. But excuse me. Um, the, so the kids, you know, father, were he was very skeptical about this whole thing um, until one day he came home from work and heard a voice just say, come here. And he followed it, being either brave or, or stupid, I don't know. But he followed the voice to the garage and saw that the garage was on fire. And so he went in to get a fire extinguisher. And then when he went to the garage it, it, with the extinguisher, you know, there was no fire. Mm -hmm. And so at, at that point, the family was just like, oh, oh, no, no, we're just not doing this. And so they actually set the bunk beds on fire. And then that brought them a sense of relief after that. And so they had to burn the bunk beds. Or at least they felt they had to burn the bunk beds, but it, it ended up working for them. And this this was really a bizarre thing. And you, you just have to take the word of the people that this was happening. And in a way, you know, how do you explain that? You know, there's a lot of ways you could say, well, they were crazy. They were all crazy. You know, it's genetics. They were all just genetically crazy. OK, yeah, but that's lazy and sloppy. Um, maybe she was a little crazy and, you know, got everybody else to go into some sort of you know, fit of, of mass hysteria. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. I mean, there's that, I suppose, but gosh, you know, it, it just doesn't add up. It, you know, it's just one of those things that sticks out and, you know, afterwards they were fine. So they experienced, you know, it, in my opinion, and of course this is just opinion and speculation, but in my opinion, a lot of these stories, you know, if they don't have a clear ending, like, Oh, look, this picture had, you know, fire retardant varnish. So clearly you know, this was going on. I think there's a difference between truth and honesty. And so I think in the case of say the crying boy pictures, everybody there was being honest. Everybody who had one of these pictures and you know, they were going through this, they were all honest. And then what we find out is, well, there was a truth to that. And so they weren't necessarily telling a truth because they all had their own ideas for why this was happening. But the important thing was they were being honest, which is different than truth. And so what you have in a situation like with these bunk beds or people's accounts where I believe the truth may not be that the bed is possessed. We don't know what the truth is. The truth is something that's objective that you have to find through objective means that more than one person can look at objectively outside of themselves and agree that that is in fact what's going on. However, there's honesty and these people a lot of times in, in this case or just went with any other case of people that I've actually talked to or interviewed who've had supernatural experiences, they're being honest. They're being, they're, they're not lying. They have experienced something. Mm -hmm. They don't know what the facts are. They don't know what that quote truth is, but they know that this is their truth. You know, and that's a very cliche saying these days to say, oh, it's my truth. But I think what people mean by that is that they're being honest. They, they're trying to present the facts as they know them or understand them. And so a lot of these cases, it's, you, it's going to be hard, if not impossible, to pin down the objective facts or truth of what happened and, and, and whatnot. But these people, a lot of times, are, are being very honest with their experiences. And, and I think that's something that, um, you know, it's important to share, that we all have these things that happen or people do have paranormal experiences. And, you know, what is it? 
you, know, you don't always have a, a good way to, to test and measure. Sure. And we're left with those unanswered questions. And so I think that's maybe uncomfortable, but in a way that's that's life. And that makes it maybe even more frightening for people is why are these bunk beds you know, connected to this. It's really, really weird. It is bizarre. It's a very strange occurrence. Is that the case from Horicon that you're referencing? Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. It sounded exactly yeah. like with mm-hmm. the, the garage on fire and, and everything there. Mm-hmm. That, that's that's one where I have um, I, I have never dug deep enough on it, um, but I, I'm curious if that family, I don't, I, I don't remember if Unsolved I could, Mysteries used last names or not. Did you actually speak with the I, family? I wasn't, I, yeah, I couldn't um, put the names, unfortunately. My publisher was like, no okay. names, sure. no, no exact places, so, you know, sure. understandably. And so, yeah, um, yeah. Now, I wasn't able to actually track them down. Okay. Yeah. So I think that I think and that's another thing that made me wonder or it just I don't want to say added credibility, but it, yeah. in a way it kind of does at least in my mind that you know there's people who will say things, you know, mm-hmm. they want the attention maybe or maybe somebody says, "Oh, look, I have a haunted doll. Oh, look, I've made a museum out of it. Come pay and I'll show you my haunted artifacts." And sure. you know that that's fun and I'm I'm not, you know, knocking that. But there are also the people that they don't want attention. They don't want money. They want to be left alone. They have this happen to them, and then they just don't want it to define them. And yeah. when that happens, and especially if it happens when they have these extraordinary accounts, yet they don't really want to you know, address it, well, that just, to me, I don't know, makes them a little more credible that, that hey, that, you know, that they're not trying to to make money or have attention out of this. They just want it to be a thing of the past. Mm-hmm. Um, it just, to me, indicates that they did, in fact, go through something traumatic. Yeah, and they, they don't want to hear anything more about it. It's like, here's my story. Believe it or not, it doesn't matter to me, but maybe someone else out there is going through the same thing, and you're not alone. I think that's what mm-hmm. a lot of this is with, with getting yeah. these stories out. Is And you're exactly right. The my truth is is a bit more than cliche these days. But, right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 it is just meaning I'm being honest from what I understand. Um, and, Which is important yes. and good, but it's also not a it's fact. not a fact. Like facts yes. don't care about your feelings. <laughs> exactly. You know, like. <laughs> Here's the reality of, of the way I've interpreted it. Um, and, and sometimes just being able to get it out there is, is what people need more than anything else. Absolutely. So. To know that they're not alone and that, you know, if they don't have an exact, you know, scientific explanation for this, at least find a way to explain it. So that idea of my my truth or the facts or, you know, all of this, I look at it as uh, both of them are valuable. You have people's honest sort of accounts of things and then you have the ob- objective facts. And within that, you know, that's qual that's that's qualitative analysis and quantitative. And you put that together. I think that's when if you allow you know, entertaining the ideas of both and trying to see what information you can glean from both is really important. And and a lot of times, you know, that's an important step for people in healing and being able to work something out that maybe I can't answer the whole, like, why did this happen to you? But maybe they could make meaning out of it for them, at least to provide a sense of closure. And that's important for people. That wraps up part two of our interview with Dr. Heather Lynn about demonic artifacts. Find out more in her book, Evil Archaeology. Until next time, for the Grave Talks, I'm Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening.